So although I normally give a lot of talks about event sourcing, this is going to be a slightly different talk. It's not going to be an introductory talk into event sourcing. I want to talk about a specific problem inside of event source systems. The problem that I want to talk about is time. How many people here have implemented an event source system before? We find the same problems in many other systems. So here we have something was created, we had some items removed, then some more items removed, and then eventually it was checked out. But how does time work in this? Normally in an event source system, everything is linearized. We come from the beginning and we go to the end. Unfortunately, this is not how things work in the real world. When we're sitting in this, we can say that the items added were definitely added before the items were removed. Isn't that nice? But in real systems, it doesn't actually work this way. What happens when we actually have things that are coming in and our event log does not actually have the appropriate order for how things might have really happened? This happens in a lot of different types of systems. The order of things that I have in my log may not represent the order of things as they happened in reality. It's a very beautiful model until it's not. If we look at this, how could this possibly show up out of order? Here we have a created, we have some items added, some items removed, some more items removed, and then we checked out. How could we possibly get this out of order? In these types of systems, we are dealing with what's known as linearization of our data. What linearization of our data means is we bring everything down to a single thread, and we have a guaranteed order of operations as we go to write them to the disk. So how the hell can we get things out of order? Well, the problem that we run into is that things do not always go into the log in the order they're supposed to go into the log. And there's a brilliant example of this, although Spain is a terrible place for me to give it. The United States would be much better for it. How many of you even know what this is? So when you write a check, when is that effective transaction date? We have lots of dates associated with a check. And in America, we love these things. And to be fair, yes, that is actually true. They actually came over the river and killed people on Christmas. That was part of the revolutionary story of America. But our check, how many times are actually on this? How many times are associated with a check? Is it one? If I go through and I write a check, and here we have 7-6-2017, could I have written this on June 15th? I could have given you what's known as a post-dated check. You will not be able to deposit this check until July 6th. But I could have given it to you in June. In this case, we're dealing with time in the future. Could I also have given you this check in August? There are many, many times associated with a check. There's the time I gave it to you. There's the time that I wrote on top of it. 
a bare minimum of two times associated with the check that I gave you. What if I told you there's actually more? We have the date that I have put on it. That is a time associated with this check, correct? We have when I received the check. That is a time associated with it. We have when I deposit the check at the bank, this is a time associated with that check. It gets better. We have when the check clears to actually put money into my account, which is a time associated with the check. Now, to be fair, if you go to the US, it's actually more screwed up than this. Because it's not just when the check clears. Normally, when you go and deposit a check, like this one's for $130.45, the bank is actually going to come through and they're going to go, we're going to release the first $100 of it. And then there's going to be another transaction where the next, 35, the next $30.45 actually clears. If you go and deposit a check, the first $100 bucks will clear on the next day. How many of you think this sounds like a sane system? But when we start talking about event sourcing and we start talking about time, this is a beautiful example of it. Because some of our times are in the past. Some of our times are now. And some of our times are predicted into the future. We are writing events associated with this check that have multiple times associated with them. And how you look at things varies depending on the dates that you receive. If I were the bank, would it make a difference whether I was wanting to see what your ledger balance was versus what your available balance is? They've got completely different times associated with them. That clearance has a balance associated with it that will change. This deposit has a balance associated with it that will change. Time is not as easy as people like to think about it as being. Very often we end up with things that have multiple times associated with them in these types of systems. Some of them can be in the future, some of them might be in the past, some of them might be now. Some of them might not have been scheduled yet. And let's go back. So now I've got my events that I'm going to write to my event log associated with this check. So we have our account was created. And then we have a deposit, type equals check, our date equals this date, the deposit amount is this much. That's pretty clear and stuff, right? Except when does that check clear? Is it when I wrote the event? Or is it at some future point, let's say 24 hours after the event was written? Or does it require another event to be written to represent that it is actually cleared? These sound like small little differences but they are actually massive differences inside of an event source system. When does this event apply? What about once I've written this, when do my subscribers find out about this? And given that my subscribers have found out about this event, how do they know when it clears? Providing they've made some assumption based upon the check that I've deposited that my balance will be in two days $1,000 more than it currently is, what happens if there's a problem clearing that up deposit? 
this is a quintessential example of where we're using time inside of an event store system, and it's causing complexity. Time is not always so simple. It's not just that I'm writing down, I have a deposit, and this will clear tomorrow, because it may not. How do we represent this to people that are listening to my events? How do I make sense of this inside of my log? Typically, we go back and we look at accounting. And accounting does lots of stuff like this, don't they? So we made a transfer today, but the transfer is effective two days from now. Why? Because that's when the money is actually going to move from account to account. But what if you don't necessarily know when this is going to happen? This can very quickly start becoming problems. I have my created. I have my deposit type, which is a check. I know what my date is going to be that it was deposited on. And I have an expected to clear. But expected to clear is not a guarantee to clear. There is a material difference between those two things. While going through and trying to deal with the other bank, well, maybe it doesn't clear. There's lots of reasons why we may not be able to clear this thing. It could even be because you are a degenerate who's writing bad checks. So when do I consider that deposit to be real? This is actually a hard question in these types of systems. The reason that it becomes very difficult is because this event actually has two times associated with it. Well, more than two, but here it's two. I have my deposit. I have an expectation of when it actually clears. Can you make decisions based upon this? Can you, as a consumer of events that are coming from me, make decisions based upon the expectation that this thing will clear in the future? Do you trust me? Do you trust every other dependency that I have in order to make that decision? So this is not what we want to do. We do not want to write an event solely with an expectation of clearing and then to assume in the future that this thing has actually happened. You always want to create another event. My expectation to clear is just that. I am telling you that within the next two days, I expect that you will see an event telling you that this is actually cleared. I do not guarantee it. Now, if I've come through, I may realize that my expectation could be wrong. Things happen settling checks. They're not always perfect. And we run into the problem of, well, we expected that this check would clear on Tuesday. And now we found that, well, maybe it won't clear until Thursday. How many of you would consider this a big problem? If you were working in, say, an accounting system. That money will not be here Tuesday. That money will actually show up Thursday. Even though we have deposited the money already, the settlement of the money does not actually exist yet. And I'm using here checks as the example. What about trades inside of a bank? Normally, we'll have a one to two day settlement period on a trade. How long does this trade actually take to settle? 
what is the status in the middle during the settlement process? These types of problems are very, very common to find in systems that are dealing with financial transactions. To be fair, a lot of other systems as well, but financial transactions are particularly bad about this. If I run into a case where my expectation needs to change, I've got a big problem. And it's not my problem as the bank. It's everybody else. When I come through, and I am not going to be doing my cleared, who else has dependencies upon this? What about wire transfers that were supposed to be going out of that account tomorrow? Should those still go? Well, maybe. And this is very, very common in this type of system. When I start looking at time, my expectations over things can change. What if I were to do it like this? What if I were to write another event that represents the expectation of mine changing so that then you as a downstream consumer can understand that my expectation has changed? That's pretty cool but it doesn't solve everything. What I love about this example is it's so simple, and at the same time, you immediately go rolling off into vast amounts of complexity with it. This is why Europe doesn't deal with checks anymore. Checks are a pain in the ass. So now our clearance expectation is no longer that this should clear tomorrow, it is now that it should clear next Tuesday. Therefore, everybody down the line now knows that this money should not be expected to be available tomorrow, it should be expected to be available next Tuesday. By the way, can we have more than one of these? Yeah, they kind of happen. Oh, one of the best ones. What if you didn't happen to sign your name just the way people like it on your check? Another three business days. What's being offered here is something in the future. What I'm looking at is trying to figure out what my expectations are, whether or not I know about all of my expectations in this particular case, and what their probability of actually materializing is. Normally, when we talk about event source systems, we have this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It's nice and easy. Here, we're dealing with expectations of things happening in the future. This is not an event that has actually occurred. This is an event that I believe will occur. And checks are one of the best examples of this. Where the big problem comes in with this is how do I deal with people who are receiving this information from me? I have told you I expect this to clear. But what if it doesn't? How do I notify you about that? What if it's actually post-dated as a check? What if it's written as a check for June 17th? Is the expectation the same as if the check is written for today? And these checks are very, very simple examples of this, but very often when we start looking through these event logs, we start finding vast amounts of complexity associated back to times and orderings of things. Because I saw them in this order does not mean they existed in this order. It could be that you were telling me something 
today that actually exists a month from now, or it could be you're telling me something today that actually really was effective a month earlier. My ordering of these events is not always how the events happen in reality. And checks are just one example of this. We can go into more and more and more examples. Checks are a particularly good one, well, not so much in Europe because nobody here uses them. Because people in America actually use them every day. So now, what happens if I have a post-dated check? You can cash it on September 1st. Everything's great, right? You now know that you have this money which will arrive on September 1st. Well, except maybe that check bounces. So what you actually have for me is a promise that you will receive some money on September 1st. It's not actually that you will receive money from me on September 1st. So how do we deal with this check in terms of modeling it? We cannot model it as a financial transaction that will occur on September 1st. What we have is a promise of a transaction that will occur on September 1st. And I'm sorry for taking you all through the intricacies of how checks work. I am quite on the European side of this. We should burn them all. But what if no one ever deposits that check and it never clears? This is a real problem associated with this entire system. Everything that we're dealing with in this system has multiple times associated with everything for when they were effective. What I see in my log as my series of events is not what happened in reality. The ordering can be drastically different than what you find in my log. Let's have some more fun. So now I've been given the expectation that this is supposed to clear on July 1st. What happens if that check was for more than $10,000? By the way, you guys might not be aware of this. In the US, if you have a check that's for more than $10,000, it's quite common that the IRS will go through and go, no, that's not clearing. Because for more than $10,000, we want to investigate it further. So now what do we do once we've got an invisible government hold that's now been put on the check? What is my expectation? Well, I'm guessing you guys have never really dealt with the US government on this one. It's not good. In fact, you're probably never going to see that check clear. Literally, you can end up in a two-year process over this. More interestingly, the same people that are holding that check that was for, say, $20,000 are coming back to you and telling you that even though they put it on hold, that check is still effectively in your account. Therefore, you must pay taxes on the account with the money that is on hold for the account that they, yeah. When we start looking at these types of circumstances, we very quickly start devolving into complexity. And we need to represent, we need to understand that event sourcing is focused on linear time. When we are doing event sourcing, we are writing to our log we are writing our log in a guaranteed ordered way. I can deterministically tell you that these items added happened before these items were removed. But what about that check? 
What ordering does it get? There are at least four times associated with our check. So where does it appear in the ordering of things? Event sourcing itself, when we look at things like this, is relatively simple. Until it's not. When we have things like checks, we have multiple timelines that become associated back to our stream of events. And those timelines can change in the future as well as existing as multiple timelines. These are the hardest problems that you will find in an event source system. What's interesting for me, these are also the most valuable problems you will find applying event sourcing to. Because if you apply event sourcing to this, we have to think in this way. Because I'm now linearizing everything, and I'm having a series of events that are coming through like this, I have to think about this problem in this way. It's not just that somebody's going to go update a database column next month. I need to think about when I write it right now, what does that actually mean? And the differences are quite subtle. Any of these things could be pre or post dated. But even once I get them pre or post dated, they're still at their location within that log. Our log is actually ordered. If you go and work with accountants, you should start seeing these exact types of problems coming up inside of their journals. I am making a payment to him tomorrow, but the money left the account today. Or it could be, maybe you're dealing with Russia, in which case it takes like 19 weeks to actually get a, a, a transfer to go through. No, I'm just kidding if there's any Russians. It, it's more like six weeks. Where we're having the issue here is that our events that we're writing down do not necessarily apply at the time that they are being written. They are things that are in the future or in the past. These are all things that have an effective date associated with them or a hopefully effective date associated with them. We believe within a 90% correct level that this should be cleared by this point in time. Therefore, you should consider it active at this point in time. These problems are actually normal to deal with inside of your event log. The problem is when we start looking at these in terms of time and in terms of how things are actually interacting. Here, as said before, we can say that this item was added before it was removed. But what if it were added with an effective date associated with it? This is where all of our problems start to come inside of these event source systems. Time can become a drastically complex entity for us to deal with. Because when I am made aware of things is not necessarily when they apply. It could be that you are telling me that you expect that this thing will have happened in one month. It could also be you're telling me you expected this thing happened one month ago, but you can't verify it. Both of these lead to the same types of problems. Whether it's you gave me a check and I consider that to be in my bank account right now, even though it hasn't actually cleared from your bank account, or whether it's the other side of this and me having given a check to somebody and when does it come out of my bank account? 
when do I consider that thing to have happened? Is it when I gave him the check? Or is it when the check clears? These are both valid interpretations, correct? From an accounting perspective, we recognize that there are multiple viewpoints through this. If you go to your bank, your available balance is not the same thing as your ledger balance. They have different timelines associated with them, nothing more. Time becomes very interesting in this. And where it becomes more interesting is when we're not talking about online systems that are talking back to a central system. What if instead of dealing with this, you are occasionally connected? So you can make decisions when you can't talk to the central server. How many of you have dealt with that situation before? Where you can make decisions off on the side, but you don't necessarily know of the other decisions that are being made. And I only saw about three hands, you are all liars. You do this every day. I am working off on some source code. I am not currently online. I am making commits to my source code. I might even be changing branches, moving commits between branches. Do I know about what everyone else in the world is doing with the same thing right now? This is the exact same problem. So what happens now when I go to push my source code? Does it matter if he pushed his source code before I pushed my source code? It matters a lot, doesn't it? How many of you have played the game of, let's push our source code really quickly so the, commit, the, uh, the conflicts go to somebody else? I know there's gonna be conflicts, that's why I'm pushing. It doesn't actually work. I don't care, I just don't want the conflicts. To be fair, we could be even more fun with this, and probably you've got a couple branches, don't you? And now we could bring up like the Git graph of the branches and how they're moving away from each other. This is all the same thing that we're dealing with in an event source system. To be fair, Git is at its core mostly an event source system. We get the same thing anytime that we apply geographic distribution. Whether we talk about me having a live service that's up online that's pulling events back and forth between two, or whether we have something like Git where I'm actually pushing. Now with Git, the problem becomes really obvious. How often do you push? Do you push like every 500 milliseconds? Like seriously, how many people here have a script that has a file watcher going, and it looks to see if files have changed, it automatically commits and pushes every 500 milliseconds. Come on, you know you want this. Literally, every character that you type gets its own commit, just to piss everyone else off. The thing is, when we start looking at Git like this, if you're working on a branch and I'm working on a branch, how many of you have ever run into this situation where, well, our code doesn't play nicely with each other? Coordination here has a cost associated with it. That my system can be offline and working, like Git, and it doesn't necessarily know about what everyone else is doing at the same point in time, comes at a cost. But this cost is often worth while. So now we've got site A and site B. Both of these are running an event store. And we have our events in both of them. We can imagine that what they do asynchronously is they send things across to each other. So as site A is working, it's committing everything locally, and it has a chaser going as fast as it can, 
And it takes everything that's been committed locally and it sends it over to site B. Site B is doing the same thing back to site A. This will work, right? Well, usually. Can we run into cases where we get different ordering here? This is an asynchronous process that's running. Could we have our items removed and our items added flipped from one side to the other? Could site A see it as items added, then items removed, but site B see it as items removed, then items added? We can take this into consideration and we can make sure that any projections that are built off of this will not have a problem because of it. But now we're getting into tricky situations, aren't we? Because now we have to talk about all of our events and how they actually interact with each other based upon ordering and the things that, how they are seen. And inside of a single availability zone, we're very unlikely to have these problems. What about when I want to be cross DC? I want to be in many availability zones and data centers. These problems are going to be more likely to happen, yes? If I have two servers that are in the same availability zone, what's the time between them going to be? 100 milliseconds? 200 milliseconds? What if we're going cross DC? This could easily be 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, no? And the further our time gets out, we'll find that we have an exponential curve for how often we actually get conflicts occurring. I can detect these conflicts after the fact. When we get these kinds of issues that are occurring, I can look after the fact and tell you these issues have occurred. I can look after the fact and fix things. Ah. When we're looking at this case, who did this items removed? Is that important? Could one user have more power than another user? As an example, this user is allowed to have made this change without seeing the change from the other person. But if they were a lower grade user, they would not be allowed to do that. What did the person who did this item removed know at the time that they did the item removed? Again, a very important detail. There's lots of things that we can do here to help with this. I can detect that this has occurred. The way that we're going to detect it is known as expected version. Sometimes in some systems, people also call it the original version. It's basically when I am writing to my stream, I say, this is event number zero, this is event number one, this is event number two. I am now writing event number three. Now keep in mind, we're geographically distributed, we may have asynchronous stuff going on. Me writing event number three might not actually be event number three. It could actually be number five because event number three and event number four were actually written over there by her, I just didn't know about them yet. It may even be event number three here, but event number five over there. My expected version, however, if I put it down with my event, would allow me to detect that this has occurred. At the time that I was writing, I expected that this would be number three. When it ends up over on his side, it becomes number five. 
I can now detect that this has actually occurred. Here we can see. We've got our 0, 1, our 1, 2, our 2, 1. Whoa. What we have here, this is the actual version. This is the expected version at that point in time. And here we can see that we got some things flipped. How hard would it be to write some code that ran on top of this to show me that we actually had a conflict? Would this be difficult? You can now identify all of the conflicts that have actually occurred here. Now, what those conflicts mean to you, well, that's a whole different story. But I can detect that these things have occurred. You would then be able to look at your information and figure out whether or not these were actually problems. Event Store will actually do this for you. What we can do is we can write the conflict to a stream called dollar sign conflicts, which basically says here that this and this have been determined to be possibly in conflict with each other. So you get a new event out in dollar sign conflicts saying, hey, go look at those events because there might possibly be a conflict. What logic you use to do that ain't my problem. It's your problem. But I can generically detect that this has occurred, and I can notify you about it. In general, this writing with expected version is what has solved these problems for us. Even when we're geographically distributed, all that we're using is expected version and saving the expected version that we had with something, and we can find when things are crossed. Nothing more. I can even generate out events representing the events that were in conflict with each other. Then you can subscribe to that so you can move forward. If we're only running in one site, we'll never see this problem. It's when we move to multiple sites. We have multiple sources of truth. And our multiple sources of truth may not be agreeing with each other. Keep in mind as well that not everything is associated to one time point. Your event will always be associated to one time point. It's the point where it was written. But it's not necessarily effective at that point, time point. It could be effective in the past, or it could be effective in the future. When you start seeing things that are going in the past or things that are going in the future, have your alarm start going off. This is something where complications may be eminent. As we start distributing geographically, most of our systems like this will no longer be linearized. The linearization effect that happens with event sourcing is a beautiful, beautiful thing. If you're running in one location. The moment that I start going to multiple locations, if I want to keep availability, I must allow them to move independently of each other. Otherwise, if I lost a single location, I would have to put all my locations as down. Which, to be fair, maybe you're working in some very, very important things and this is totally reasonable to do. However, in the real world, we cannot put every location down because one location is down. You lose the internet in this data center, so you stop taking transactions in all data centers. Sounds like a spectacular idea. I'm sure your ops team is going to love you over this one. Everything that we're talking about here is choices. And these are not trivial discussions. These are very deep discussions about our business. And how important it is for a piece of information that has been known to be known in other places in how long of a period of time. And what happens when we know something here, and we've known something else over here, and they may be conflicting with each other? 
Later, these pieces of knowledge are going to cross, and that's when we need to be able to detect this. Very often, we can get into situations where we would be breaking our rules, but only because I didn't know about something else at the time that I was doing it. I was retroactively breaking my rule. Or more importantly, she was breaking my rule without knowing the stuff that I had done, and that's what led us to break the rule. These types of failures, however, are rare. We can detect them, and that's where our focus should be. We should allow these things to happen. Why? Because in order for us to reach a level of coordination, to make sure it doesn't happen, introduces downtime. We have availability problems because of this. Instead, we assume that things will work. In the rare case where they're not working, we detect it and we fix it or notify somebody to fix it. Seriously, in some of these cases, you're actually better off just sending an email to somebody. You go deal with this. I don't have automated code to deal with this. The main thing we need to consider about is what level of safety do you actually need in all of this? How many seconds of data on either side would actually be within your risk profile? Keep in mind, I am allowing multiple data centers around the world to be interacting with the same things without coordination. So if one is down, we don't have a widespread outage. There are times where you may want to escalate the level of safety that you need, and this can be done. We can use, as an example, a lock server. By default, however, we should be erring towards being lenient on this because we don't want to accept the possibility of downtime associated. And the main thing that we really, really need to focus on is how much are you willing to trade off in order to get this? Every time that you do stuff like this, there is a cost associated with it, both from a systems perspective and from an operational perspective. How much are you willing to give up in terms of possible downtime, as an example, in order to make sure that you don't get this ordering issue? This is one of those foundational things of, I can't do both. You are picking one or the other. If you err towards wanting to have this thing actually be consistent, you are giving up something else. Be okay with what else you are actually giving up. And this decision is not always black and white. More often than not, this decision is well off in the gray areas that are so gray you can't even tell the shades of gray from each other. It's very rare that the answers to these questions that we're discussing are yes or no. They are not binary questions. They are well, usually, unless. It's a hard decision to make how we deal with this. There are multiple paths that we can go down. The overall error should be towards being available here. If we think about the worst cases that can happen, would you rather have me have screwed up a few transactions out of a few thousand, or would you rather have me do none of the few thousand? In other words, I screwed up all of them. I did not allow them to happen. Usually we should be erring towards a couple screwed up things are totally fine so long as you did all the other things.
most people today running event source systems are running a completely linearized system. They are not running multiple locations. They are not dealing with these kinds of issues. They have a perfect ordering of their log. The moment that you come to reality, you're going to have multiple orders of things that are in multiple different places because, well, the speed of light is a bitch. I, excuse my language. When I have something in New York and something in Chicago and something in London, it becomes prohibitively expensive for me to ensure that they are all completely coordinated. And when I say prohibitively expensive, I'm referring to both operationally and in terms of cost on latency per transaction in order to actually make that happen. I would, in my rare failure circumstances, rather tell you something that is mostly correct than to tell you nothing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Overall, these types of systems have traditionally been linearized. Once you start doing geographic distribution, linearization goes out the window, usually. I can still do it, but the downsides of doing it are normally too large. I end up coming back with availability issues. Instead of dealing with availability issues, we have moved our problem, and now we're going to deal with possibly out-of-order event issues. Which seems more likely to piss your boss off? Nobody can work with the system right now versus on three accounts we managed to flip two transactions. This is the trade-off that we're actually sitting in in these kinds of systems. I can make everything perfect and seen in perfect linearization way all across the world. But in order for me to do that, I now have accepted that there are bits of downtime that must occur. More often than not, you will prefer to let the systems diverge from each other and try to correct it, as opposed to trying them to keep them in complete sequence with each other, guaranteed. But if we're missing one of them, then maybe we just don't work at all. This is a quintessential case of, do you want a bunch of small little failures, or do you want one really big failure? Our small little failures that we've introduced remove our risk of the big failure. We now have these five systems that are all running independently of each other. And in failure conditions, there will be small little failures that occur with ordering issues. But it will still work. Well, mostly, usually, sometimes. This is a quintessential trade-off in software. And it doesn't only exist in event source systems. It exists in almost every system that you will deal with. Very often, we want to introduce small failures to remove our risk of big failures. I don't mind if I completely trash his bank account. Literally, it comes up and it says that he's got negative $1.4 trillion. I don't care. Why? Because that affects one user. I care much more about not being able to tell any of you what your balance is. I would be even happy to tell you wrong balances, so long as I'm still telling you something. And this is the trade-off that we're looking at here. It's me coming through and making sure that I can tell you something, even if that something might possibly be wrong. 
Ah, to be fair, it's probably accurate within like 30 minutes anyway. It's close enough. Your boss does not come running and screaming because you're showing people 30-minute old information. Your boss comes coming and screaming when you're showing people no information. No? Okay. Does anyone have questions? No questions. Okay, we're all free to go. Run away. <laughs> <laughs>